forward here. Great, okay. Welcome to Polar Week, a live event uh, with some researchers from the Association of Polar Early Career Scientists, APEX, and we're connecting to the poles. These are some folks who work in the polar regions um, as young researchers, and we get to hear a little bit about how they've gotten to um, make their way to working in the polar regions. So just to give you all an idea of what Polar Week is, we're right in the middle of it now, so it's Tuesday, the 18th of September, 2012. Polar Week is a global celebration of the polar regions each equinox every year. So that means that each of the polar regions is getting 12 hours of daylight and night at this time of year. And so we figured it was a good time to shed some light on the polar regions and help you learn a bit more about them. So Apex is working with Arcus, who I work with, and Janet Warburton, who's on the call event right now. It's the Arctic Research Consortium of the United States. And another partner is Polar Educators International. And that's a group for um, teachers or educators that help to work and learn about the polar regions too. There are so many activities going on with Polar Week this week, and you can look on the APEX website to learn a little bit more. So to give you an idea of this platform we are using, we have a, a slide here, and your slide should be changing right now. So now it says Blackboard Collaborate. And this screen tells us a little bit more about how to use this platform. A lot of you have already found the chat box on the bottom left of your screen. And if you're just joining us, you can share there how many students you have with you and where you are from. That would be great. Um, also, you're welcome to use a if you have a question at the end of the presentation. And let us know if you're having any trouble seeing slides pass through. So if you do have questions, <coughs> you can write them in the chat box throughout the presentation. At the end of the presentations, we'll hopefully have some time for you to ask questions live to these um, APEX members. So it's pretty easy. All you need to do is press the talk button down to speak and unclick it when you are done. So it's uh, kind of like using a radio. Click on and click off. We'll help you guys through all the questions at the end. Again, as you're joining us, you're welcome to type into the chat box your name, where you're from, and the number of students or adults participating with you. So that's kind of our quick introduction here. And I wanted to pass it on to our uh, APEX members. And just to see, we have Alan Pope with us and Anne Mathilde Theory. And they're uh, not in the United States at the moment. I know we have some classrooms in the United States, but hopefully we've got some questions outside as well. I know we have people from the Dominican Republic, and I'm not sure if we have anybody from Europe just yet. But at this point, I'm going to turn the microphone over to Alan Pope, because he's going to talk a little bit more with us about um, how he gets to be doing his work in the polar regions. So Alan, if you're ready, you're welcome to turn on your video and let us know what you have to say. Cool. Can you guys see me and hear me? Just put in the chat if something goes wrong. Great. So um, correct me if I'm wrong, Sarah, but I'll just tell you when I want to go on to the next slide. Is that right? Um, cool. So uh, sure, why don't we go on to the next slide? So I'm going to be talking a little bit about what I do in the polar regions and how I got interested in the polar regions. Um, so just a little bit of background. Um, my name is Alan. I'm originally from just outside of Boston, Massachusetts. And I'm now doing my PhD in Cambridge, England. So I've been here for four years now. Uh, and I have about one more year to go, so not too far from the end. Um, I originally got into polar research uh, because I love being outdoors. I love skiing. I love hiking. I love 
just experiencing the world around me and trying to figure out a little bit more about how it works. Um, and well, it started out in college that I was a chemistry major and was working in Switzerland in a lab there. Um, and so every weekend I was going out hiking. Um, and one of those weekends happened to go hiking near the Aletsch Glacier in, uh, in central southern Switzerland. Um, and was really, really intrigued by it and wanted to know more about it. Um, and so one thing led to another, and I ended up studying glaciers full time. So I'm going to take you through some of the uh, field work that I've gotten to do and kind of a, a story of how I've gotten um, how I've gotten more and more into glaciology. And so the, the map in the lower left hand side of the screen there, um, all of the stars are places that I've gotten to do field work related to glaciers. So some of them are pretty far north, some of them are pretty far south, um, and some of them are in pretty warm places, uh, which might not make sense immediately. Um, I don't think I actually have any pictures of Africa in here, but um, that's a place where a couple million years ago there used to be glaciers. And so we were doing a bit of geology there to study where there used to be glaciers. So anyway, Sarah, if we could move on to the next slide. Um, so in my undergrad thesis, I got to study Antarctica. Um, I was studying the geology of the area in order to understand what the ice sheet there used to be doing thousands of years ago um, and tens of thousands of years ago. And so most of the slides are going to be just like this, a collection of photos, and I'll try and explain some of them. So on the upper left-hand side, you can see some glaciers, some small glaciers that there are now. We were working in an area that, unlike most of Antarctica, is not covered by ice. So when you get there, the, uh, the big plain, the one on the lower right, lands, um, lands on a beautiful, beautiful flat white area. Um, and then we got helicoptered to a little bit rockier of an area. And so one thing we were studying was partly what the ice used to do and also how the landscape has changed over time and how much it's eroding and what that tells us about the climate. And so the big photo is us three uh, field workers standing around this huge, huge canyon. Um, and we were collecting samples to see how it formed, whether it was wind that formed it, whether it was water that formed it, and all that sort of stuff. Um, and I was really lucky because that was something I got to do while I was still a student. Um, I was just I was interested in chemistry, wanted to do some field work, and asked one of the professors in my department, hey, do you have a research project? They said, sure. Um, a lot of the field work was pretty, or sorry, a lot of the lab work um, was a little tedious, um, measuring sand grains and picking them out of a crushed sample and taking them through some chemicals and that sort of thing. Um, but the field work was totally, totally worth it afterwards. So uh, next slide, please. So um, then we move on to Sweden. Um, this is where I was working actually just last year. Um, not directly related to my field work, um, or sorry, to my research, but somewhere where I got to work as, I guess, research staff or research support staff. Um, so in the middle, bottom, and on the right, um, you can see some of the science work that we were doing. Uh, the field station I was working up in northern Sweden has the world's longest continuous uh, glacier mass balance record. So what that means is every year in the winter uh, and in the summer, they measure exactly how much snow and ice accumulate on the glacier and then melt off as well. Um, and so this is the world's longest record. And it's really these continuous records and detailed records that help us correlate how glaciers change and relate that to climate. Um, so we got to do lots of using a steam drill to drill down and put a big stake in, in the snow. And then you measure the levels as it goes down uh, through the summer. Um, and then dig some snow pits to look at the, the density of the snow as well. And beyond being able to do research, um, what was really fun was there I got to experience what it's like to be on the supporting side of research. So when you're a researcher, really day in, day out, you're just taking measurements. But there are tons and tons of people behind the scenes, as it were, um, that help make that happen. And so it was cool to be one of those people. Um, and what that meant was being able or getting to drive around a snowmobile, 
a lot and dragging around uh, equipment from down at the bottom of the valley up to the field station, helping researchers that uh, set up their gear. Um, on the top right, you can see what the field station itself looks like, um, those red buildings there. And it was my job to make sure that things were fixed if they got broken or just keeping things clean and neat and um, keeping snow shoveled away from all of the doors when it got stormy, all stuff like that. Um, but then there are the really fun parts as well, you know, gorgeous weather, skiing on Sundays when you get the day off, um, and also playing around in the bad weather, whether it's looking out for reindeer, which is what's in the bottom right, or in the bottom left when, uh, when the visibility conditions are really bad. You can't really tell how far away people are, um, and you get to take some fun photos like that too. Um, cool. So uh, next slide. We'll move on to some of my own research. Um, and I've titled it, What Color Are Glaciers and Why You Should Care? Um, you'll notice the, the U in there for anyone that happens to be on the European side of things. Um, I haven't changed my accent yet, but some of the spelling still gets me. Um, so yeah, I'm interested in what color glaciers are. And um, I, I look at what, uh, that's one way to say, I, I look at different kinds of snow and ice and you can see a whole bunch here from bright white to really dirty to covered in ash to bright, bright blue. You know, when the, the ice gets really compressed, it turns that bright blue color. Um, and why that's interesting to me is um, different colors of snow and ice will absorb different amounts of energy. And what that means is they'll melt at different rates. And so I use satellite imagery to tell apart different kinds of snow and ice. Um, and look at that across time and figure out the best way to look at those uh, to help understand how glaciers are changing and how they will change. Um, so along with that, I said I use satellite imagery, but I have to do a lot of field work to understand what's going on on the ground as well. And so my first uh, field experience or my first field work for my own PhD um, was up in Svalbard. So if we could go to the next slide. So I don't know how many of you have heard of Svalbard. But if you've ever read uh, The Golden Compass, uh, those books, then, then you'll at least probably know where I'm talking about. Svalbard is a, it's a group of islands halfway between northern Norway and the North Pole. Um, it's managed by Norway, um, but is open to a lot of different countries to work and do research in. Um, and so I was working at a very international research station, something like 17 different countries have research stations. And on the right hand side, that's a, a little aerial shot of, of the station. Um, and so it was really cool was getting to organize my own field work. And so now that I've worked there, um, I guess you could say I have my, my own glacier. A lot of people do research there, but I think of it as is my glacier. And so on the top and the bottom, those are photos of Midre Loven Breen in, in Norwegian, or the Middle Loven Glacier. Um, it's named after an explorer that first explored the area. And so what we were doing um, was walking around on the glacier and pointing our sensor at the ground in a lot of different places. And John in the central photo there is demonstrating what that looks like. Um, so we point at that little white panel and then at the ground. And the white panel tells us what perfectly 100% reflectance is. And then we point it to the ground to see how bright it is. And on the left-hand side is what some of our data looks like. And I'm not going to talk about it too much, but I felt like I had to throw it in there. Um, because there are lots of really, really pretty photos. And I want, wanted to make sure you guys realize I do research as well. So there's lots of science and you know, lots of numbers, understanding how um, the, the physics behind when light hits the glacier surface, what happens so that it behaves differently in red, green, blue, near infrared, and shortwave infrared, and what that means for the amount of energy that it absorbs. So what I was, I guess, lucky enough to do in Svalbard was have the experience of working in a large field station, um, but also um, get to plan it all myself. So I had to get the instrument. I had to plan all of the airplane flights and exactly what the plan for research was. So there's lots of logistics um, going on, which is, I think is really interesting because a lot of research can be big projects and it was good to, to focus down. 
And then I got to do an even more exciting project the next summer. So if we move on to the next slide. Um, um, which was go to Iceland. And so in Iceland, uh, we weren't working on a field station. You can see in some of the photos that there are tents. Um, so we were just working and camping on the middle of a glacier uh, in central Iceland for two weeks. So in the middle left, um, that's a zoomed out satellite view of our glacier, um, Langjökull, or the long glacier, because it's kind of long and thin. Um, and so what happened was the, we, we got driven up onto the glacier. Um, this, this area tends to get some tourists, uh, maybe, maybe a dozen every day or so. This guy, Adi, in the, in the top right photo, he drives in this, calling it a super jeep isn't quite right, I guess, super bus, um, because he just drives straight up onto the glacier over huge bumps and crevasses and snow and everything. Um, and so he dropped us off and uh, left us there for two weeks, pretty much. And we did the same sort of research, um, again, measuring the, the reflectance or the brightness of the glacier surface. Only the fun part there was that a volcano had gone off um, previous, you know, a couple months earlier that year. Um, because Iceland has both glaciers and volcanoes, and sometimes the two mix in really, really cool ways, which wasn't exactly planned, but made for a really interesting experiment. Um, and so some of the other photos there you can see in, in the central top, Ali is, is pointing at the ground there and has a frowny face because when there's a tent on top of the glacier surface, further to the right, yeah, there we go, um, it insulates, it kind of acts like a blanket, and so the snow doesn't melt as fast, and so you have to reset up your tent every couple days or else you're just sitting on this platform. Um, and so, yeah, I guess I should go back to the science that that I combine those field measurements with the satellite imagery and the airborne imagery. Some of it at really, really high resolution. So from the air, you can see um, each pixel is about five or six feet or two meters across, um, which is really, really cool to be able to do across such a wide area. Cool, so next slide. Um, and then it kind of comes full circle that I said I got interested in glaciology because I loved hiking and I loved being outdoors and understanding what's going on around me. Um, and I guess that still happens to me on a weekly basis. But last weekend I went hiking with some friends in uh, Wales, which is to the west of England. Um, and all these photos are showing areas where there used to be glaciers um, in past ice ages. And these glaciers have carved the landscape that people um, in one of a really densely populated part of Europe where people go hiking and experience on a daily basis. And so uh, you can ask my friends if you ever meet them that every once in a while I would just point to something and just start explaining like, this is how a glacier formed that. Um, and it's really cool to be able to do that. And I think they thought it was cool most of the time um, as well. So yeah, that's I guess the, the short and long story of how I get interested in glaciers and some of the cool field work that I've been able to do. So next slide. Um, again, here, my name is Alan, and if you want to get in contact with me, you can um, find out more on that website or get in touch with me by email or Twitter. Um, I'm on both quite a lot. Um, so yeah, I hope that you enjoyed that. And if you have any questions, either type them in the chat box or however you want to deal with it. Yeah, let me know. Thanks, Alan. That was great. Um, yeah, so if people are interested, certainly type your questions into the chat box. And it looks like we will have some time at the end if you want to ask your questions live. So, um, oh, looks like Elizabeth Eubanks, a student, John Glenn, wants to know what was the funnest thing you did, Glenn? Funnest thing that you did on a glacier. Go ahead, Alan. Wow, I've done a lot on glaciers, so that's not a really easy question to answer. Um, I would say the funniest thing that we ever did on a glacier, let's see, this past summer um, I was teaching on a, oh, I completely forgot that other slide. I was teaching on a field course for undergraduates, so college students, um, and I did this course when I was a student five years ago, um, where you go up to Juneau, Alaska, 
and take six weeks across the summer and ski across the Juneau ice field. Um, and you're living on the ice field and studying the ice field and traveling across it all at the same time. So that's the setup, but we were camping in on the, the glacier one night and we're staying there for a couple nights so we dug ourselves a big kitchen and everything. And we had had dinner and it was still pretty early. So for about an hour, someone got out their iPod and a portable speaker and had a dance party for an hour out on the glacier as the sunset was happening for the whole time. So I'd say that's probably the funnest thing that I've done on a glacier. That's great. So maybe what we'll do at this time is pass it over to Anne Matun and um, we'll see if there's more questions for both of you at the end. So I'll let you get started. I see your video and you're good. Go ahead, Anne. Okay. Hi. So I'm Anne Matun. Uh, I'm from France, so sorry about the accent. <laughs> um, and my story is a bit different from that of uh, Alan. Uh, I grew up in the countryside in, in France and I really enjoyed that. I also enjoyed the outdoors but didn't really have a, a chance to, to go skiing too much because it was far away from home. Uh, but uh, when I was a kid, uh, and actually you can go to the next slide, Sarah, sorry. Uh, when I was young, um, a teacher of mine asked us in school, um, I was maybe 12 or 13, uh, uh, the, the teacher, she asked us uh, what we wanted to do later uh, as a job, uh, as an adult. Uh, I don't know, could have said I want to be a, a, a doctor or I want to be a hairdresser, but um, I actually had just, I had just read uh, uh, um, a magazine talking about people working in Antarctica and I thought that was really interesting and that I would love to do that, but I was 12 or 13, so uh, I didn't really expect to end up doing that. Uh, but years went by and uh, I had a great biology teacher and I started studying biology. And uh, yeah, you can go on the next slide, uh, Sarah, please. Um, so that kind of came back, that Antarctic dream uh, thing I'd really like to, to work. Uh, so it's uh, here it's a drawing from uh, one of the first uh, French Antarctic people, uh, I mean in the 50s, Paul uh, Emile Victor. And on the right you can see just a few uh, things that I found on the internet uh, a few days ago. Uh, just the, the it was uh, in a magazine describing um, what are the uh, requirements for being in a, a polar scientist. And so that's the kind of thing I read when I was uh, a teenager and I didn't really expect to uh, to end up working in Antarctica. But I read things and I, uh, in particular, I heard that the French Polar Institute, uh, you can see their logo on the, hand, uh, on the right side, they were recruiting every year young scientists to carry out field work uh, um, in, in Antarctica. Uh, so I started my studies in biology and after a few years I thought that, well actually I could apply, maybe I, I'd have a chance. Uh, so you can go to the next slide. And when I was 23 I ended up working in Antarctica for 15 months uh, at the French station du Mont d'Urville. So it's about 3,000 kilometers south of uh, Australia. Just 10 kilometers south of the of the Antarctic Circle um, and uh, so that really was a great experience not only because you daily job is go and watch penguins uh, it's uh, a beautiful place uh, and a great time but the thing that I really enjoyed was the human experience during eight months there were only 24 of us uh, that's what we call wintering in Antarctica. Because it's a French station, it's not as big as the American station. I, I know that uh, uh, on McMurdo, which is the big American station, about 200 people winter every year. So that's, I mean, compared to the French station, it's quite big. But there were only 24 of us. So you have to 
uh, deal with other people and and make sure that all gets well. Um, so we had a cook on the station, we had a, a doctor, we had a station leader. There were maybe a third of the people uh, of the winters were scientists, but that all the other ones. So there was like a, a plumber, mechanics, uh, all kind of tradies. So that really was a, a, a great time. Uh, I. Uh, yeah, we have much more penguins, many more penguins than in McMurdo. And actually, I don't know if uh, some of you, or you probably heard, I don't know if you, you've seen the movie, but the March of the Penguins movie, it was filmed in Dumont d'Urville uh, about 10 years ago. Actually, actually, Dumont d'Urville is uh, the, the only uh, station that is walking distance from an emperor colony during the winter. It's 20 minutes walk. Uh, from the station, uh, and the Australian uh, station is that is also close to an emperor penguin colony during winter is 40 kilometers away. So it's uh, not the same thing if you want to go and say hi to the penguins. Uh, so we can go on the next slide. Uh, uh, after my, after this uh, winter in Antarctica. I came back to France and uh, I was offered a PhD position in Strasbourg in France with the people I had worked for during the winter uh, and it was to study uh, Adélie penguins. So it's uh, summer penguins, they only breed during the summer in the Antarctic. So they also breed uh, all around the station, uh, the French station du Mont d'Urville. So I went back twice in Antarctica uh, for three, four months each uh, to study the behavior and the ecology of the Adelie penguins. So we capture them, we mark them, uh, and we monitor them during the whole breeding season. And the research question that we are uh, trying to answer is what makes a, a penguin a good penguin? I mean, a good penguin is a penguin that's uh, able to raise two big chicks by the end of the season. Uh, so we, we try to see uh, how the weather can affect the penguins, um, how the chicks grow depending on environmental condition or depending on the parent status, if they are like big and fat penguins or not. So that's the kind of things we, we're looking at. Um, so you can go on the next slide, uh, Sarah, please. So these two chicks, uh, two Adelie penguin chicks, they're like a, a brother and a sister. So you can see that there's a, a big difference uh, of size uh, and weight between the two. So we're trying to answer this question is what, what, what happened? Why, why, big, why is this that this small penguin is so small and the other one is so big compared to the small one? Uh, so that's the kind of things we, <laughs> we're looking at. Um, and that's, uh, so I'm almost done, I just didn't want to talk too much about my research and maybe uh, have more time for questions, uh, how I ended up doing this kind of research. So the next and last slide is just, uh, so it's me in the field uh, catching a, a chick and we, we will measure the chick, take a blood sample to do uh, lab analysis afterwards. Uh, we'll do this analysis in the lab in France, um, and and so yeah, that's probably the end of it. I just uh, the last thing I wanted to say is well, you never know what you'll do next, but um, so it's really interesting to be able to uh, to work as a polar scientist. But what I really wanted to say is actually the um, uh, life in in the Antarctic is so different from the life that you actually have at home. And this is really a, a great experience. It, it's, uh, uh, I, I'd say it's the best. <laughs> okay, so I don't know if you have any questions now. Um. And did you get to decide that question about the chick sizes? Who do you work with? So I work with uh, scientists in France here in Strasbourg. 
uh, and we also uh, work with people in Australia at the Australian Antarctic Division. Well, they actually have uh, quite a lot of uh, data. Uh, so. Uh, we don't have the exact answer yet. Uh, it seems that there might be differences whether the chick is a male or a female. The male tend to be a bit bigger than the female chicks. Uh, it's also really dependent on the environmental conditions. Uh, last summer, was, uh, there was a lot of sea ice, uh, really thick sea ice. And um, the penguins didn't do well at all. Uh, compared to previous years, so we have data for from several years to compare with and and try to answer these questions. I saw a question about the blue color. Uh, so, is this for the penguins or for the glacier? I'm not sure. Okay, so so for penguins. <laughs> uh, yeah, the, the cheeks tend to be a, a bit gray, blue, so that's the actual color. But the, the, the adults, they will be really black and white. Great. <laughs> Go ahead, Henry. We see in your photos that you have like a an orange winter coat on, and we were wondering if the color uh, attracts the penguins or does it will it scare away the penguins? Is there any relation with the why it's orange, that bright orange color? Okay, so it's uh, um, no, it doesn't seem to scare the penguin, neither to attract them. The um, Adelie penguins they build nests, and they stay on their nest for the whole time. So it, the 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 orange color is really, in, uh, I mean, the penguins really don't care about that. But um, actually, these uh, uh, jackets they're a really old model. Uh, all, all kind of jackets uh, that are made uh, given to the people working in the field every year. And I, I just think the orange because when there's a blizzard, uh, it's easier to see the people from the distance uh, if, they are, if they have orange jackets than white or black. Great. Elizabeth has a question there. Ralph wants to know how many species of penguins has Anne seen or worked with? Okay, so I've actually worked with two penguin species, so the Adelie penguin, which you can see here, and the emperor penguin, and we saw the emperor, yeah, right? We saw the penguin just before. Um, I've also seen other penguins, um, sometimes in zoos, or in Australia too, in uh, in Tasmania and in uh, Victoria uh, near Melbourne, you can see uh, blue penguins or fairy penguins. They're the smallest penguins on uh, on Earth, uh, and that's the three penguin species that I've seen in the wild. Uh, and so the the most uh, I wouldn't say social, but um, the, the emperor pen, penguin, they're really the most curious penguin. Uh, Sometimes you're just sitting um, like 30 meters, 30 meters from the colony, and one penguin will come and look at you, and uh, as long as you don't move, he'll just stay there watching you. So it's really, really, really nice and funny. But the Adelie penguin, they don't do that at all. If you come too close to them, and which happens if you want to catch them uh, for measures and uh, samples, then they'll just um, bite you and hit you. So they're not really nice, <laughs> uh, as nice as the emperor penguins. Great. And there's another question for you, and then we'll go to Henry. Um, in Elizabeth's class, Anna wants to, Anne wants to know the highest number of penguins you have been with at one time. 
how many in this photo? Okay, so about the emperor penguin, there were about, uh, if I'm not mistaken, there were about three to four thousand pairs in the Mondeville, so that would be a maximum maybe seven thousand penguins at once. And but it's actually a small, uh, not a very big colony. They, they, some colonies are much bigger, but they're uh, much more harder to go to. And about the Adelie penguins, uh, they are 45,000 pairs around the Dumont d'Urville station and 15,000 pairs uh, just on the same island as the station. Uh, so that can make uh, quite a lot of penguins, yet uh, very noisy and especially very smelly. <laughs> Yeah, it does smell funny. <laughs> uh, when you first arrive on the station with the helicopter and you get out of the he helicopter, you say, oh my god, <laughs> what's that smell? Uh, especially for the Adelie uh, penguins when it's uh, warm uh, in the summer. Uh, the, emperor, the emperor penguin, they don't smell that bad because usually the weather is, the weather is colder during the winter. So it doesn't smell that bad. Okay, Henry, go ahead. All right. Um, I want to, I want to know approximately how long do these penguins live? Okay. Hi. Uh, nice question. Um, so the Adelie penguins, they we know uh, from uh, previous studies that they can live up to 20, 25 years old. The emperor penguin, they can, uh, so that's the maximum uh, age that they can get. The mean would be uh, lower. The Adelie penguin, so let's say 20, 25 years old. And the emperor penguin, they can live up to 35 years old. They're actually a third species. I have a, a photo of them on the uh, slides, but the snow petrel, it's about the size of a uh, pigeon, maybe. Um, and they can live uh, even much longer. We saw one that was 45 years old. We know that because it was bended as a chick. And we know, so we know exactly when it was bending and how old the bird is. And actually, the bird was older than the scientists studying them, so it was quite funny. That's neat. Great questions from everyone. Any other questions? Any other questions? Karen, um, yes, if we can ask one more question. Yeah. Yes, just a question. Uh, the first time you went uh, to this area and interacted with the penguins, I mean, did they seem um, uh, perhaps scared, or did they recognize that you were there? Um, I mean, th did they seem as if uh, they know that there's something different, uh, that you were there, that there's something different with their surroundings? Okay, so the station was built in the 50s, so there's been people almost every year since that. So um, uh, I'm not sure the penguins really realize if there's uh, someone, uh, uh, someone here. Or I mean, uh, the the penguins don't really realize if uh, there's like changes in people or everything. They will actually realize that you come re very close to them if you want to catch them. Then they will react and have a. Um, um, uh, a flight response, they will just want to move away. Um, let's see, let's go to Elizabeth. You can ask your question live. Uh, are these penguins in danger? Yeah. 
Okay, so for the moment, the Adelie penguins, they're not endangered. Uh, neither is the emperor penguin. I mean, in the international list of endangered species, they're not in that. But all the penguin species are protected. Uh, all the penguin species breeding in Antarctica, they're protected as part of the Antarctic Treaty. Uh, but we don't know if in the future the penguin uh, might be more endangered than now uh, because of climate change. So that's thing that scientists are uh, currently studying. Uh, so they're not endangered for the moment, but they're protected. Okay, go ahead, Elizabeth. Go, talk now. Talk, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. With the concern of global warming, if it gets too hot in the climate for the penguins, could they die? I can't turn it off. All set. Okay, so about the emperor penguins, uh, you know, when it's 25 degrees Celsius, so I don't know how that would, how much that would be in Fahrenheit degrees, because I live in Europe, but. Um, as, in, as a human, when it's 25 degrees, you don't need to wear much clothes, like, I mean, you know, summer weather. Uh, for the emperor penguins, uh, the, the similar temperature would be minus 10 degrees. So if it's uh, too warm, they, don't, they won't like that. I, I guess that they could die from uh, temperature being too warm, but it would be... Uh, it would happen only if the temperatures would be very, very much warmer. So I, I, I don't know the, if there's any threshold that's known, but uh, for the moment, they're not endangered by the, uh, by the small changes in temperatures. But if the, the temperatures would need to, uh, to, to change a lot for the penguins to be endangered by that. Thank you. Alan, can you talk a little bit about uh, warming and glaciers as well? Are you finding anything? Sure. So um, I guess my research isn't directly related to uh, relating temperature to glacier change. Um, so I'm not going to be able to, I guess, talk in huge amounts of detail. But what I can say is, um, in general, we see a warming trend. Um, and that is, in, in, I guess, in general, all across the globe. Um, but there are places where it warms up more than others, and places where are, which start out colder than others. And so changes in temperature will mean different effects for different places all over the world. So for example, um, in Alaska, the photos that are up here right now, it's really warm. Um, and actually an increase in temperature in this area um, has led to more uh, water evaporating over the ocean and more snow dumping on the ice fields there. And so even though more is melting in the summer, more is also accumulating in the winter, and so it kind of balances out there. So there's more extremes, but the overall balance is the same. That's different from somewhere like um, the Antarctic Peninsula or in northern Sweden, where increased temperatures are largely leading to just increased melt. And so you see glaciers receding there um, in some really, really strongly. Um, so in Sweden, where the station has been running for, um, for I guess it's been running for almost 60 years now, they have photos from earlier in the century, and you can see how much it's receded, hundreds of meters. Um, so it's really huge. Um, and then there are places like central Antarctica. Um, and when Anna was talking about how I guess, emperor penguins don't feel that little change because it's already pretty cold, um, glaciers in Antarctica kind of feel that way. You know, If it's minus 20 or minus 40, um, then just a little bit of change isn't going to do that much to them yet. Um, and to answer Janet, 
uh, all the little holes in that in that photo down the side of a snow pit. Um, those are snow density measurements. And so what we're doing in that pit was we dug pit the pit all the way down to the level of the previous summer surface. So that hole, um, I guess, 20 feet or so of snow, is it even that much? Yeah, 20 feet or so of snow accumulated during the past year. And so if we have depth and then we measure density, we can see the total amount of mass of water that has accumulated in that year. And so you do that at different elevations across the glacier, uh, so you can see how much it's gained or lost in that year. Um, Gary, I'm not sure if that's a question or not, but I'll put a, a few sentences together on the Himalayas are a really, really interesting place for studying how the glaciers are behaving. Um, because, partly because it's a really difficult area to work. Um, there haven't been very many ground measurements there. Um, and since it's so mountainous, it's actually really hard for satellites to see just the glaciers and not the mountains around them. Add on to that the fact that the mountains are still pretty active tectonically, um, and there's lots of other things going on. Um, it's not entirely clear what's happening in the Himalayas in different places. There's part of the Himalayas that's definitely seeing some of the increased precipitation. Um, changes to the monsoon have meant increased precipitation, per particularly in the western, uh, the northwestern Himalayas, um, from what I understand. But um, in other parts where there have been some ground measurements further to the east, you're definitely seeing retreating glaciers. Um, so that's a really active area of research right now, and it probably will be for, for some time. Um, yeah, I'll be really curious. Ask that question again in, in two years, and we'll see what the answer is then. Thanks, Alan. That's great. Janet was asking a question to the audience. Uh, are any of you interested in being a scientist in the polar region, or maybe at least learning a little bit more about it? You can type your answers in the chat box here. So we have just a couple more minutes. Um, trivia question from Jake. How big would a glacier be, have to be to take down a Titanic? If that's for Alan. I'm not actually sure how to answer that question. Uh, what I can say is that the glacier that took down, or the, the iceberg which came off of a glacier that took down the Titanic, um, that iceberg would have come from Greenland. Um, so in terms of big glaciers, Greenland is the second biggest in the world because it's covering that huge island of Greenland, which is the biggest island in the world. The only thing bigger than Greenland in terms of ice is Antarctica. Um, so it's coming from a whole continent. I don't know exactly which glacier it came from, so it might have come from a relatively small one in terms of, of Greenland proportions. Um, but yeah, not exactly sure where it came from. It would have been, um, well, the iceberg definitely would have been a couple stories high. I can say that. Thanks, Alan. So people, if you're watching the chat box, a couple, uh, Henry, some of Henry's uh, students at Notre Dame are interested in being scientists in the polar region, so that's great. Any other questions from anyone in the audience? While we're looking for questions, I want to thank our presenters so much for coming out and being a part of the, this webinar and for Polar Week in general. All right, lots of people are chatting, so I want to see what we're saying here. <laughs> One preschool kid, great, perfect. Well, I think it kind of seems like we're wrapping up here. We want to say thank you to our presenters. Thanks so much to everybody else who's helped us with these uh, webinars. And have a great rest of your polar week. If you want to do more, you can certainly find all kinds of activities um, and a chance to draw some ice core art right here at this website. So thanks so much. And yep, launch a virtual balloon. Perfect. Thank you so much. Have a great day, everyone.